<laughs> Hi! <laughs> um, welcome! I hope I am live uh, here in the Freak Museum Instagram page. Um, my name is Carolina Loyola Garcia and I am part of the Not White Collective, which is a group of 13 uh, artists. Um, who all self-identify as either biracial or bicultural um, or both in some cases um, immigrants or the daughters of immigrants and we all uh, work uh, with the idea of breaking down um, the systemic um, ways in which oppression uh, has um, subdued um, minorities and as part of the collective we started uh, a, a cooking series um, before the election last year uh, as a way to invite people into our homes and into our food and into our culture and that was an effort on our part to get the vote out and, um, and also share the stories of you know the other <laughs> as as oftentimes uh, people like us are considered right um, and and so thanks to Alison Zapata who is one of the collective members who worked as a liaison with the Freak Museum uh, we are now doing the same series a new series but the same concept uh, in conjunction with their Frida Kahlo exhibition uh, that just opened at the beginning of March and goes until the end of May. And so today's my turn. Um, I am the third one in the installment, so there's going to be 13 episodes to this series. Uh, the first one was Sena Ruiz, the second one was Fran um, uh, Ledonio Flaherty, and I am um, doing this show today. And so I'm going to be sharing with you a bunch of things. I'm going to be sharing um, pictures, family pictures, I am going to be cooking a budin de zapallito italiano, and I'll tell you, you know, in a bit what that is. And I will also be making some cocktails. And uh, I always cook, you know, with some wine, so that's why I'm sort of, you know, entertaining myself with this. Um, I want to get started by sharing this one picture. So the Frida Kahlo exhibition is uh, at the Frick Museum. It's an exhibition that um, displays a number of uh, photographic work that Frida um, kept, right, and kept hidden a lot of it. So it was not discovered until, you know, after her death. Um, and, and a lot of those were family pictures, right, that both her father took, um, uh, Nicholas Mori, some of them, some other photographers, uh, friends, and a lot of them were unknown photographers, right, that took those pictures. And, and you get a glimpse into Frida's life, personal life, her family life, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and so I, I want to share also some pictures that are important for me in my own uh, life uh, and family history. And I think the one that uh, has resonated the most with me lately is this one picture that my cousin Christian gave me he he somehow inherited this from his mother right who inherited from her mother right and it's a picture of this um wedding i don't know if you guys can see that or not um so it's a wedding of this couple right um and what it says in the at the bottom the encry encryption at the bottom is the name of the photographer roberto gonzalez fotografia artistica artistic photography and this is in the Plaza de Armas, sort of like the central plaza, in a town called Chillán, which is in southern Chile. I am from Chile, by the way. And so on the back of this uh, picture, there is a dedication. And he just gave me this, you know, a couple of years ago. It says, it reads, Un cariñoso recuerdo um, a mi inolvidable y querida tía Rita, esposa... Prima y primo. And then it's signed Carolina M. de Lecourt. And then it has a location and date. It reads Curanilawe, Mayo 29, 
<laughs> so when I saw that, I was like, wait a minute, 99? Oh, 1899. <laughs> so this picture is really old. And, um, and she, and this is, you know, Carolina M. M is for her first, her last name, uh, Meya. And the Lecourt indicates that she married this guy, right, whose last name was Lecourt. And so this lady is my, one of my great grandmothers, right? And after whom I am named, right? My father, this is on my dad's lineage, right? Of, of the family. Um, and so they, they named me after her. And this is, you know, a picture of her wedding to this gentleman by the name of Ismael Lecourt. And she was 15 years of age in this picture when she got married. And I don't know, to me that's mind blowing to have this little memento and her handwriting. Um, and so there were lots of pictures like this at the exhibition uh, in the museum of Frida's heritage, of course, and story. Uh, and I have a lot of other pictures that I might, you know, bring out as we're going through this hour that we're gonna be together. So um, let's go into what I'm gonna actually cook. So I am gonna make budin de zapallitos italianos. And this is the recipe that my mom used to make. My mom was such a great cook. She was a really, really good cook. Um, she would just make stuff, you know, from nothing. She would like produce, you know, amazing um, dishes. And a lot of it she would do by, you know, from memory. Um, my mother is still alive. She's 81 now and she has dementia. So she doesn't remember that she was a great cook. Uh, she doesn't remember that she liked to cook. She doesn't really remember much anymore. So it's kind of sad, but I did collect a few of her recipes, you know, when she was still, um, when her mind was still, you know, with us. Um, and, and so the, the recipe that I have is from her. I always, whenever I cook, uh, if I am cooking from a recipe, I will most of the time alter things a little bit. Um, but you know, there's like the recipe functions as like a, as a start point, right? Um, so, zapallitos italianos, these guys, zucchini, right? Um, I've always wondered why in Chile, I don't know how it is in other Spanish speaking countries, but in Chile, we call them zapallitos italianos and I never, you know, I've never known why, and I, I, and I often times I would wonder, why not called Zapallitos Italiano? Uh, so that translates as little Italian squash, right? And so I looked it up the other day, and so yeah, sure enough, zucchini is also, you know, an Italian word, um, the word that you guys use here in the States, right? Um, and, and zucchini means little squash, right? In Italian. Uh, and so it seems to be that um, in the process of Europeans coming to America, right, uh, the Americas, not just, you know, the United States, but the Americas as a continent, right, um, they took a lot of fruits and vegetables back to Europe, and one of them was the Mesoamerican squash, right, and, uh, and in Italy, apparently, they, they, they grew it in such a way that they developed a variant of it uh, that, that was a little smaller in northern Italy, and, and that's why they started calling it little squash, right? Uh, the Italian for squash seems to be suca. So zucchini is like a little squash, right? And so that's why in Chile they're called, you know, zapallitos italianos, little Italian squash, because they sort of went over there and then came back in a, you know, sort of new variation, which has happened a lot in the process of the colonization of the Americas from both, um, you know, the Spaniards, the Portuguese, and the, and the British. Um, so, zucchini. What else are we going to use? We're going to use some onions, right? I, I kind of prep things ahead of time because I am not really good at... When I cook, I, I like to be quiet. I don't like to speak as I am doing things. Uh, it's kind of like a meditative thing. And also I think as I approach menopause, like I am less are able to concentrate on more than one thing at a time. So, you know, it was easier for me to prep certain things before the show. So, diced onions, garlic, and I had some mushrooms. Um, I had some mushrooms in my refrigerator that needed to be, you know, cooked. So I'm gonna also, you know, add mushrooms to the, the sofrito. So the sofrito, is the sort of base, you know, the basis for whatever you're gonna cook, right? Uh, that's what we call it. Um, and, and then in addition to that, I am using six zucchinis about this size, right? 
I am going to be using also six eggs. Um, I'm going to be using breadcrumbs, two kinds of cheese, uh, Parmesan um, grated cheese, and this is a, a, a mix that Trader Joe's sells uh, that has Romano, as, uh, Asiago, and Parmesan cheese as well. But I really like how they shade some of it. It's going to be, this is going to be used for the top, for the texture. And then in terms of spices, I'm going to use um, salt and pepper, right? I like to use um, real black peppers, you know, corn peppers, and, and grind them. And then I'm going to add a little bit of again, which is a smoked um, spicy chili. Is that right? Yeah. Um, that, you know, it was used in, in, that is used in Chile, right, in, in my place of origin. Um, and this is an, uh, an, uh, a way of making chiles that is uh, part of the indigenous tradition of the Mapuche people in southern Chile, and they smoke it, right? And they use it as a, a condiment. So these are the ingredients, right? Um, and we're going to start by sauteing the, the onions, the garlic, and the mushrooms. So, um, I, I am joined today by two people, two wonderful people, uh, the person that is behind the camera, Todd, who's my boyfriend, and my daughter, Isidora, who is also here helping out, and she's going to be joining me also in conversation throughout the show. So, welcome you guys, and thank you for being here. So, come with me to Carolina's Kitchen. Cheers. So, the stove is over here, so come. This way. Okay. So let's get this baby started. Hi, Camilo says, love you all. Hi, Camilo. Hola, Camilo. That is my nephew who lives in Chile and he just joined us, I guess, huh? How are you, Camilo? How are things in Santiago? How are you and wonderful Edgar doing? Okay, so some olive oil. Olive oil is the basis for like pretty much everything that I cook. I try to get extra virgin olive oil. Um, Camila says me and Edgar are here. Aww. Ah, Camila and Edgar, you guys are so cute. Love you guys. So learn how to make the budin de zapallitos. Actually, I never told you guys what budin de zapallitos translates into, so I told you the story of the zucchini, but budin is just basically like a souffle, right? That's what we're gonna make. Like a, you know. Okay, so here goes the onion. I should have waited for the, the oil to be a little warmer so that when you drop the onions in, it sizzles, right? I didn't, so when you make this, try to do that. Wait until the, um, so, you know, you want to wait until it's it's hot and then drop like one piece of onion, shh, wait for that shh sound, right? It's going to take a minute here for this guy to get going. So I encourage everybody to go see the show at the, at the Freak, it's really interesting. I have to be honest and say that my favorite part of the exhibition at the Frick wa was the, um, the Nicholas Murray exhibition. Um, I really appreciated his way of seeing Frida. Like from all the pictures, his collection of portraits of her, I felt were the ones that were really seeing her and paying attention to her and being present for her and they just seem so loving and so adoring right in a way that I feel Diego Rivera never really looked at her in that way um I, I got that feeling that Diego was such a, a narcissist artist and um the relationship revolved very much around him so I don't know I don't, I don't know he saw that he saw Frida in the same light that Nicholas, you know, saw her with these adoring eyes, right, of the photographer. Um, and that was, that was really beautiful to see those images. And she just looked gorgeous and at peace and, and sort of witnessed being visible. Nicholas Mori, by the way, was a photographer. I forget where he was from. He was an immigrant from... 
Eastern Europe, I believe. Um, but he lived in New York, and they met in, in, in New York. And he was Frida's lover for about 10 years. She was married to Diego, but both Diego and Frida had, you know, a number of affairs on the side. Um, I don't know if they sort of agree upon it. Yes, I'm hungry. Hungry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did somebody post that, or you just looked it up? Mm -hmm. yeah. so it was in one of her letters that she asked him to give her some Hungarian name. Ah. Yeah. Did he give her a name? Mm -hmm. Hungarian name? Well, I only saw hers, so. Uh, yeah. Nice. Okay, so you hear this is Ling? That's what I'm talking about. I love that. So. And I love the, um, the smell that starts coming out. They should soon I hope do some kind of um, fourth dimension right uh, Instagram where you can actually smell like people are doing when I bring my spices over here um, I'm gonna also use this other salt as well just regular salt and this salt has a little bit of red wine in it so I'm going to also put this one in, and some pepper, and merken, M-E-R-E-K-E-N. What? about the Frida Kahlo exhibit was um, the, the sense that even though she experienced a lot of um, pain through her life, physical pain, right, because of her accident um, and her, she had polio also as a child, so, um, so, so yeah, she was, you know, she was often bedridden, spent lots of time in the hospital, and had a lot of different surgeries, right? Um, and she experienced a lot of pain, but I did get the sense from little annotations that she would do on some of the pictures, right, that are displayed at the Frick Museum, that she had a really good sense of humor. Um, there is one picture there w that, that shows her bedridden with these like bendas, how do you say bendas? Bondages? Yeah, like bondages um, that are pulling her head, right? And attaching it to, like, to the back, some, some structure that is on the, on the back of the bed, right? Probably to keep her spine straight, right? Um, you could tell that she could hardly move, right, uh, with that. And, but then there was an annotation on the picture that I forget exactly the word that she used, but the, the idea was this. It said, lamentablemente jodida, or, you know, so, uh, I, she didn't use the word jodida, but she used something, a synonym of that, which means, in English, means something like, uh, unfortunately, messed up, right? Uh, but you could sort of see how she's making a comment on her own sort of fate in a, almost like in a laughing way. And I, I don't know, I wonder if that's, I want to add the garlic now. Uh, I wonder if that's cultural, if it was just sort of her own way of, um, or if it was her own way of dealing with pain and, and her, you know, and, and, and the accident that caused her a lot of disability, right? Um, Cicatriz says, watching this while drinking my coffee from my Frida Kahlo mug. Awesome. <laughs> that is great. The, you have a Frida Kahlo mug, right? I, it's, it's funny, as I was prepping for this show, I started pulling things, you know, that I, that I have that are sort of Frida Kahlo related. Uh, books, that was the first thing that I started, you know, um, pulling out. 
and, and so I pulled my books out and then I started realizing, oh, I have this magnet, oh, I have this, you know, tote bag, oh, I have this. And then we were looking at, a, at a, what, some of the books that I have and sort of marking pages that we want to share with you guys. And my daughter was like helping me with that. And so she was reading through and like asking me, how do I mark these pages? And I'm like, oh, here. I have a little, you know, Frida Kahlo <laughs> sticky notes. You know, with like, <laughs> and I, somebody gave me this, actually, you know, who gave me this? Rachel Simon. Rachel, if you're watching, thank you for giving me this. It's coming really handy, you know. Cicatrice says, I have several toes, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard not to have Frida Kahlo things, right? Uh, and Isi, can you bring me that doll that sits there, the Mexican... Um, and now I'm gonna add the mushrooms. So my mom's recipe did not call for mushrooms. I am adding them because I have them, right? Uh, my mom sometimes would add a, a ground beef to this recipe. So she would make like a pino, what we call pino, uh, which is the same sort of basic mix of onions, some garlic, uh, ground, you know, beef. And uh, if you wanted to, you know, be, Non-vegetarian. I'm making a vegetarian version. So this here is smelling really, really good. So when I was talking about Frida Kahlo and pain, right, and her relationship to them, how she had a certain sense of humor, and something that I have appreciated about Mexican culture, right? Um, I've been to Mexico a few times, and I have a number of friends who are Mexican also, and it's the, the relationship to death, right? And um, and I bought this in one of my trips because I just want to remind myself how when I die, I still want to be fabulous. <laughs> and I, I just love that idea of like friending uh, death and not escaping or pretending that it doesn't exist, but it's our ultimate destination, right? And, and on this journey, I feel that it's I don't know, how are you going to get there, you know, in what shape, with what spirit, and how are you going to embrace it, right? So this is how I am going to embrace it, just so that you all know. <laughs> and it's kind of like also, um, you know, a Buddhist thought in my Buddhist, you know, readings and learnings. Um, and yoga also, the idea of embracing death and, and, and prepping for it, is kind of like the ultimate spiritual journey, right? Um, okay, so I think this is ready. I'm going to show this to you. So, you know, it's nice and it smells wonderful. I wish you guys would smell. So I'm going to leave that for now. That's all of this one. italiano, como lo hacía la, mi mamá, más o menos como lo hacía mi mamá, es un, es un poco mi versión, pero, you know, it's, 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 the, the base, la base es la misma que hacía ella, the same base as my mom used to make. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the eggs, okay? So, it's a souffle, so it has a lot of eggs. Um... So, I'm going to use six eggs for this guy. Te amo, pero los zapallos italianos, brrr, <risa> Sole, te perdiste la historia que conté de, 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 de por qué se llaman zapallos italianos. I'm just telling my, my, my cousin is saying that she doesn't like the zucchini. My cousin is kind of like a picky eater. She always wants, one time we were, we, we were up together. Um, Camilo tampoco. Yeah, of course, Camilo is her son, right? And of course, he doesn't like, you know, zucchini either. Metal palo. Okay, so I'm going to whisk, whisk these guys. I do this by hand. I don't, you know, they don't need to be like foamy or just mix them up, right? Um, the whole egg, you don't have to separate like in some other recipes. The yolk from the. What's the name of the yolk? La clara y la yema? What's the name of the yolk? And the. White. Egg white. Yeah. So, mixing it up here. And 
and then when I'm done with this, I am going to mix all the ingredients up. So I should tell you guys that, as I was saying earlier, I, I prep some of this stuff ahead of time so that I will be able to finish it within the hour, right? Um, and you could see the end result. So the, the zucchini uh, needs to be boiled, right, until they're really soft, right? So I just chop them in like three, each of the zucchinis, put them in a, in a pot. And I boil them until they're nice and soft, and then I mash them, also just manually. It doesn't need to be fully, fully mashed, right? You, need still, you still want it to be somewhat chunky, but... Um, uh, and I don't drain the water out of them after they've been boiled, because I like that, you know, um, sort of soaky quality, and then all of, all of that dries up in the oven anyway. So what I'm gonna do when I'm done with these eggs is mix up the zucchini, which as I said, is already made and I'm gonna show it to you in a sec. The eggs and the sofrito that I just made, okay? So I'm gonna bring in this other pot. So here is the zucchini that I made earlier, right? I don't know if you can see it. So you see how it's still chunky? I keep the skin, okay? I keep the skin. I like the skin, it has lots of protein. My mom used to not, you know, like the skin of fruits and vegetables in general, she would, she would always um, skin them. I keep the skins because uh, a lot of the nutrients of the fruits and the vegetables are on the actual skin. So I'm gonna mix this guy up here with this. And add a little bit of salt to this mix, right? Um, and I just add it, I don't have a specific amount, you know, for for how much um, salt or different spices I, I use. I usually smell my mixes. I smell them and if the right amount of spices are there, then, you know, it smells in a certain way. And, and then I know it's right. Okay. Um, so this thing is good. And now I am going to add this sofrito to the mix. I just got this wok last year and I love it. I have another wok that my sister gave me years ago when for my second marriage actually as a wedding gift. Second time I got married and then divorced. Um, but it, and I love that wok, it's still you know back there, but it's really big. So it's you know when you're gonna make smaller amounts, it's just heavy and cumbersome to work with. So I prefer, this one is really nice. And it's so non-sticky, it's wonderful. So this is where I'm gonna smell things. Mm, yeah, this is good. Okay, so this is what this thing is looking like now. So what is it supposed to smell like? Uh, it smells, um, it's a very rich smell of, um, what I smell mostly is the mix of the of the spices with the sofrito and the zucchini. That's the main smell of this thing right now. Okay, um, and then we're gonna add the crumb, the breadcrumbs. Okay, if you make your own breadcrumbs, it's wonderful. I I I just bought you know these guys to made. Um. And same thing with the breadcrumbs. I, I cannot give you like a measurement, like you have to put this much amount. Um, I just kind of eye it. And, and, and I am looking for a consistency, right? I'm, I'm looking for it to thicken up a bit, right? Not too much, obviously, but it just needs to be the right thickness, uh, which I think this is not gonna need much in terms of breadcrumbs. My mom used to serve the zucchini on the, so you know how I told you that she, she would skin them? So they would take the inside, the flesh of the zucchini, and then keep the skin. And this mix right, that I am making, um, it was much more uh, mashed than, than my version of it, right? They would put 
on the zucchini on the on the zucchini skin and then they would bake it that way so that's how they would serve it also on the skin as a, as a like a like a little boat right um i don't have the patience to do that <laughs> so and then oftentimes people will just leave the skin like people would just eat the inside of the scoop out the inside of this little boat and then um eat, you know leave the skin on the on the dish okay so i think i feel this is about right and now one other thing that i'm going to add to this is the parmesan cheese so I'm gonna use this guy that is just the, the Parmesan, 100% Parmesan, right? And I'm gonna put some of this in the mix as well. I go generous with the cheese, just, you know, adds to the whole flavor. She also learned from Abuela. Yep. Yeah, my mom would be was very very good on making things with cheese. She really used cooking as a way of showing love. My mom. <laughs> she would be concerned about what you ate, what you could eat, what you liked, and she would definitely appeal to your to your culinary um likes and dislikes and desires and wants, right? To to win your affection. <laughs> Marina says cheese makes everything good. Yeah, definitely. Cheese is usually a good mix. Yeah. So um, just for the, to make sure that this is gonna be, you know, properly seasoned, I'm gonna add a little bit more pepper. I like things being seasoned. Well, Merken, Merken is spicy, so if you don't like spice, then, you know, just use salt and pepper. I personally like things when they're a little on the spicy side. Dennis asks, what are you making? I am making um, a zucchini souffle. So we call it in Chile, budin de ceballitos italianos, and it has eggs, zucchini, cheese, breadcrumbs, uh, spices, and a sofrito, which I just finished a little while ago, which has onions and diced onions, garlic, and I added mushrooms just because I had mushrooms, you know, that I wanted to use. So what I'm gonna do now, thanks for asking, uh, is put this in a casserole dish. I just learned the proper term for this kind of, you know, pot. <laughs> uh, my mind is just like, he don't? He likes it. Oh. Uh, okay, and I'm gonna pour this whole thing inside of here, right? Here's a spoon. And I should let you guys know that my oven is already at 350. I did that earlier, so it's waiting for the souffle to be put in. And so you see how nice and good it looks here? So now to finish it, I am going to sprinkle that breadcrumbs um, over it, over the top, right? To make like a nice little crust. Uh, let's see, don't be shy with the breadcrumbs. You wanna nice, even, as even as you can make it crust on top. Pepsi Flaherty says, yum. Yum, Fran, you joined. Yay. Okay, and now comes el dedal de oro. The, you know, cherry on top, which is this guy. This is where I like the different textures that this cheese comes in. This is three different kinds of cheese and how they shave it. Gives you this, um, this variety, right, that I love putting on top because it just makes it look really nice. And as a visual artist, I like when things look nice uh, or interesting or textured, right? I always go for that. So you see, you see like these sort of big shaved pieces that you get? And there's a mix, right? There's like a mix of different cheeses and there, a lot of them are shaped like that, but there's also smaller sort of chunks at the bottom, right? So what I'm gonna do is just 
sprinkle this whole thing around here, right on top of it. And again, don't be shy with the cheese. Mm. There we go. And yeah, I think that's good. Maybe just a little bit more here and here. And now this baby is gonna go in the oven for about 20 minutes, okay? Because Bees wants to know what your name is. Um, I want to see your art, so I am an artist as well. Okay. Um, in the oven, 20 minutes. And you can, you know, iron. I mean, as soon as the whole thing is um, sort of bubbly and you start seeing a little bit of crust forming on the top, light brown, that's when, the, when you know it's ready, right? I like the clear casserole dish um, because it allows me to see, you know, the, the content of it, right? The only thing that is raw in there are the eggs. And the eggs don't take much time to cook. So, you know, about 20 minutes is, you know, a good mark, but you can always, you know, just take a look at it. So I'm going to set my timer to 20 minutes. Um, and now, while we wait, we're going to make cocktails. So, follow me to this other part of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, who asked me? What about the... Um, Sika Chris wants to know what your name is. Uh, she wants to see your art because she's an artist as well. Hi, Cicatriz. My, na my name is Carolina Loyola Garcia, and I am part of the Not White Collective. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at carolina.loyola.garcia. Uh, I think on the, on the Frick Museum's Instagram, uh, all of the names of the, of the collective's members are listed. Um, so if you don't know how to spell it, you can find it there. Uh, and I would love to, you know, share my work with you. So come over to this side for the for the cocktail. So a good friend of mine, Mr. Sam Burns, gave me this book right some years ago, right? Uh, and then actually the other day when I went to see the exhibition at, at the Freak, I saw this book in their gift shop. So if you're interested, it's there actually. Um, and so I thought I would, you know, it has a bunch of different cocktails named after, you know, famous artists and um, um, Missy Elliott and Beyonce are here and Gloria uh, Steinem and um, so, you know, the Frida Kahlo one is the one that I am going to make. And if the, the liquor in it, you can see the ingredients there if you want to maybe put the camera closer so that people can see the different ingredients. But the, um, the base for it is tequila as it says right there right i chose to do it with mezcal instead because i like mezcal better mezcal has like a you know smoke smokier taste that i personally really like um so i am gonna make it with mezcal you can do it with tequila uh, the ingredients on this as you just saw are hibiscus syrup that you make it says here to make it from tea which i did i bought this hibiscus very tea the, uh, the store the other day and when I was making the syrup last night oh my god it smelled wonderful so hibiscus syrup and you just basically basically stip the the tea bags right enough tea bags uh, for depending on how many servings you want uh, for 15 minutes and then add a whole bunch of sugar it's like a hundred grams per serving so per glass that you want to make um, and then, you know, stir it some more and bring it to a, to a simmer with the sugar, make sure that all the sugar is dissolved and then let it cool. And that's your syrup, right? That you're going to use to make the drink. In addition to that hibiscus syrup, um, you need, uh, lime juice, you need the liquor, which could be tequila or mezcal in my case, in my case. And, and then you need, you know, ice. What kind of mezcal? I have this one. I bought uh, an artisanal mezcal, um, Espadin, and we, we did a test run last night, I should say, and it, it's really good. <laughs> I, I just went to the wine and spirits here in my neighborhood, and uh, they had a lot of different varieties of tequila, but very few different mezcal options. Uh, they had like three or four, I believe. One of them was like a mainstream mezcal, and there were a couple of artisanal ones, so I bought, you know, one of the artisanal ones. 
Um, I just love the smokiness of mezcal in general. We were reading about the difference between tequila and mezcal because they're both made from the agave plant, right? Um, and the main difference is how it's prepared, like how it's, uh, in this case, this is smoked in uh, under, under the earth, right? Um, and that gives it, I think, that smokiness. So, uh, what are we going to do first here? So you are going to have to come around with me again, right? Um, and maybe while I'm making this, I'm going to talk to Easy about the letters that Frida Kahlo wrote to Nicolas Mori. As I was telling you earlier, Nicolas Mori has this beautiful collection of uh, photographs, portraits of Frida at the Frick right now in exhibition, and they're really beautiful and, and, and so respectful and so adoring, you know, who Frida was. Um, that that was my favorite part of the exhibition. Um, and so I have one of the books that I have, right? And here, let me let me just show you the book um, that I pulled from my collection. Is this um, book of letters and writings that Frida Kahlo, you know, uh, did and, and, and sent to a variety of people, right? Friends, lovers, family, etc. And so I, as we were prepping, I asked my daughter, Isidora, I said, hey, why don't you look for letters that she wrote to Nicholas and we could maybe, you know, share some of these because, you know, I'm sure that there were some. And of course, sure enough, we found a lot. And they're interesting. They're really interesting. So you should probably come closer so that people can hear you. It was interesting how, like, passionate and, and like, she had, like, a sense of ownership, right, over him in how she wrote to him. Uh... So here, let, let's read like, you know, one of the paragraphs that you found while I make this drink here. Okay, sure. So this is when she was in Paris in February of 1939 and she was in a hospital because she was sick. Mm -hmm. um, and so she couldn't go back to the hotel afterwards. She was almost ready to get discharged and the wife of Marcel Duchamp invited them. Invited her to stay with them. The wife of Marcel Duchamp. It's like that, the people that she was hanging out with. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Um, so here's like a little blurb um, that she wrote to Nicholas. Uh, your telegram arrived this morning and I cried very much of happiness and because I miss you with all my heart and my blood. Your letter, my sweet, came yesterday. It is so beautiful, so tender, that I have no words to tell you what joy it gave me. I adore you, my love, believe me, like I never loved anyone. Only you will be in my heart as close as you, <laughs> always. I've, I haven't told you a word about all this trouble of being ill because he will worry so much, and I think in a few days I will be all right again. So it isn't worthwhile to alarm him. Don't you think so? <laughs> That's so funny that she would talk to Nicolas, his, you know, lover, her, her lover about Diego, her husband. And, um, I mean, they, you know, they, I guess they all knew about each other. So I just added two shots of lime juice to, to start the prep of this cocktail, right? Um, two shots of li fresh lime juice that I squeezed earlier. Um, now, but this is the hibiscus syrup that I made last night, right? It's really sweet. Um... And so it was one shot of lime, two shots of this. I'm gonna make enough for two drinks here. So hopefully, so I'm gonna add four shots of this hibiscus mix. One, and two, and three, and four. There we go. I would put more because the hibiscus thing is really, really tasty. Mmm, so sweet. And now for the mezcal, let me just rinse this real quick. Can, can you look for that letter that she wrote where she was like, complain, not complaining, but being really um, sassy about the surrealists? Oh, that's the same letter, it's just a little. Oh. <laughs> and then down. two shots of mezcal also per per glass that you want to make per drink. So I'm going to add four here. 
One, two, and three, and four. Okay, there we go. And now we're gonna add some ice to the mix. And it says on the book to do it on a shaker, but my shaker is really bad. It's like, you know, leaks all over the place. So I'm gonna just um, use this. And maybe what you guys wanna do while I put the blender on, maybe you wanna go with EC over to that side to read that letter, right? Uh, so that the noise is not too bothersome because this is gonna get loud right now, so. How long? Just like a minute, but you can start reading the letter that she wrote where she was talking about the about the surrealists. about this guy Breton who's an SOB as she calls him and and so this one part says yes uh, so I had to wait days and days just like an idiot time that Marcel Duchamp in parentheses a marvelous painter who is the only one who has his feet on the earth among all this bunch of cuckoo lunatics SOBs of the surrealists he immediately got my paintings out and tried to find a gallery finally there was a gallery ca called Pierre Cole uh, which accepted the damn exhibition. Now Redon wants to exhibit together with my paintings, 14 portraits of 19th century Mexicans, about 32 photographs of Alvarez Prado, and lots of popular objects, which he bought on the markets of Mexico. All this junk. Can you beat that? And it just keeps going on and on. <laughs> that is so funny how she didn't like the... I have to say that Frida was really revolutionary. I don't think people realize that... Um that as a, as a woman in the first half of the 20th century in Mexico, as in the rest of Latin America, right? Um, your voice was not all that important, right? And then on top of that, Mexican society, just like Chilean society, was very Eurocentric, right? And so, and so her choice of, of dressing, right, of adopting the, the campesina, the, the native outfit, right, um, and, and have that as her identity, her visual sense of self, right, for the world, um, at that time in Mexico and not identify as, you know, a, a, a Euro, a Eurocentric, Euro-adoring, um, you know, a, um, artist was was bold was really 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 bold uh and that was a huge statement political statement because she was aligning with the communists and with the leftists right Diego Rivera was a big you know declared communist work you know all his work depicts a lot of his work depicts the workers workers rights the indigenous you know people's rights and and Frida very much aligned herself with um with that movement and with that way of thinking and so her decision to adopt the folk in with dressing, right, uh, and that became her image, was not just out of cuteness, it was a political statement. Um, and some of the pictures of the freak also, you would see her in drag, like there was a family picture where she was dressed in, um, in her dad's, you know, suit, right, with really sleek hair on the back and her mustache, right, so she played on this sort of sense of um, fluid gender identity at a time where you know it was very bizarre and rare and off the off off the mainstream, right? Um, I mean, it still is, but you know, back in the first half of the twentieth century in Mexico, that must have been like you know for people kind of like a cuckoo thing to do. So she was she was out there. She was very very progressive. Um, and I, 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 I'm, I'm impressed by that, actually, um, that she was brave enough to take that on and live that, right? Um, 
because he must have gotten a lot of criticism, right? And looks and... <laughs> so one thing I'm gonna add to this is flowers, right? And fruit. So I bought some flowers um, just for ornamentation, but I'm gonna steal one of these guys, two of these guys for the drinks. So again, this is a hibiscus um, mezcal cocktail, okay? So I'm gonna do this. And I'm going to do this for this other guy here. And I'm going to add some fruit to the mix as well. I'm going to add some blueberries and some raspberries. Just to sprinkle with some more color on. I love doing this. It's like little kisses. <laughs> mm. All right. And voila! Is you want to taste this one? Thank you. Cheers. Salut. Mm. Mm. That's very good. Salud. In honor of Frida. Mal says, beautiful. Camilo says, looks amazing. Cheers. Uh, Fran says, me want now. I know, right? <laughs> Girls of the collective. My sisters. When we go on our retreat, our long-awaited retreat, sometime in the future when we're all vaccinated and safe, I promise, I swear, pinky swear, However you want me to swear, I'll make you guys this. These are so good. These are very, very good. Fran, you're going to love it. <laughs> so sweet. Mal mm -hmm. mm. no, says, viva la vida. Viva la vida. Pura vida, as they say in Costa Rica. So, let's go see what the souffle is doing. Come with me, come with me, come with me. Okay. We're supposedly four minutes away from this baby being done. <coughs> and yeah, it's getting there. So I like to see a little bit more color on the top before I feel that it's ready. I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's a little bit too white, you know, too whitish, yellowish. Um, I like to see more brown, more golden, you know, browny <coughs> color on the top. But it's definitely getting there. It might need a few extra minutes, but uh, it's gonna be, you know, super tasty, and that's gonna be our lunch. We are gonna sit down here at the table when we are done, and we are gonna share these budin de zapallitos italianos. And we have a couple more minutes where I'm gonna actually share with you some more pictures. So these, I am, I am in my family, I am one of the, the, the people that are really interested in our heritage and in, you know, ancestors and who came from where and being from Chile, the, 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 the cultural, racial, ethnic mix of Chile is very, very, very mestizo, which means mixed, right? Um, I mean, I'm not going to go into detail into what mestizo technically means, but, you know, it's a very mixed uh, cultural, um, you know, uh, group of people, right? Um, lots of European, lots of indigenous um, uh, roots, right, for mostly everybody. Even though it's very Eurocentric to this day, and the more European you are, the sort of better, better you're going to be treated. Um, there has been a movement, fortunately, to recuperate our indigenous roots and our heritage, right, um, in that way. And so, as a person that is very interested in heritage, right, uh, my dad at some point sent me all these pictures, and you can see here, it says, para Carolita. So I am Carolita, to my dad and my mom, and my cousin, Cristian, all three of them call me Carolita. Oh, even, even my cat came here for the show. She rarely shows up. <laughs> 
And, and so when my dad sent me this, this was in 2003, right? He sent me all these pictures, right, of the family with a beautiful letter, right, handwritten letter. Uh, and with a little addendum here where he, you know, labeled each of the pictures and then wrote me like a little description of who is in each of these pictures, right? I treasure this because um, first is a lot of people that I never met, right? And, and the fact that my dad, you know, wrote this um, and shared this information with me was, you know, wonderful. So I'll just show you a couple of these pictures that... Um, I think are really interesting. Uh, so this is my grandmother, Esperanza, my dad's mom, and and here there's my other grandmother coming up. And actually, this is so this is the same lady, right? Um, on her wedding day, to uh, Valentin Loyola. And it's interesting because we know a lot about her heritage, right? This right here, but not a lot about his heritage. And he, he was from our family, the one that had the indigenous roots in him, right? And there is not a lot of history around him. And so his history was erased somehow in the passing from, you know, generation to, to generation. And the family members who were, you know, descendants of immigrants from Europe, like that history is more clear. And I think that's an interesting sort of reality that we tend to hide, you know, our, our native histories and, and preserve the ones that are more associated with the, with the, the, the colonials, right? The, the colonial um, powers at B. And we talked about that, we talked about that in the collective um, quite a bit. That thing is telling me it's ready, but I don't think it is. And this is another picture of Carolina, the lady that um, I am named after. <laughs> and I don't know much history about her other than the fact that she married really young and that this is her, right? She, she died very young also. She died in her early 30s <clears throat> and left five children. Okay, so this seems to be done and we're almost out of time. So I'm going to take it out real quick just to show you where it's going. But I'm going to leave it in the oven for a couple more minutes before we actually eat it. But I'm going to just take it out real quick and show you where we're heading with this, right? So you can start seeing how the top is getting a little bit of, you know, golden-ish. You see it on the edges, right? You can also see, you know, the bottom of it, right? So I think this probably needs another five to 10 minutes. So I'm gonna put it back in the oven and I promise I will take a picture of this when it's finished and I'll post it to the Frick page and also on my own page uh, so that you can see where it went and how it ended up. So, it was so nice and fun to do this. Um, I think we all get a little nervous with the, the live component of it. Uh, but, you know, a little bit of a mezcal hibiscus drink will always help with the nervousness. And I want to wish you all a safe coming into spring. Hope you all get vaccinated soon. And here's to my sisters of the Norway Collective and to the Freak Museum for putting up such a wonderful exhibition of Frida Kahlo's uh, legacy in terms of photographic work of uh, documenting her life. So with that, I want to say goodbye. Thanks for watching. Uh, see you guys next time. Love you too, Camilo.